Nobody with us from the Zoomiverse yet. Okay, so before we start with anything new, does anybody have any final questions from chapter three? We have completed our discussion. Examples from chapter three. Anybody have any homework questions or questions about any of the subjects that we covered there in chapter three? We're good to go. All right, well, if we're good to go, then let's move on. Chapter three was about one dimensional motion, motion along a straight line. We did both kind of horizontal motion and more vertical motion. Now we're gonna move into two and three dimensions and try to uh, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to expand what we learned in chapter three into multiple dimensions because one of the reasons that we use a um, one of the reasons that we use a Cartesian coordinate system is that when you have a coordinate system that has 90 degree coordinates, X is 90 degrees from Y is 90 degrees from Z is 90 degrees from X. Um, each one of those uh, coordinates or those dimensions are then independent. And what we mean by independent is that if you're moving in the X direction, only in the X direction, then you have no movement in the Y direction or the Z direction. If you're moving only in the Y direction, then you don't have any movement in the X direction or you're moving in the Z direction. So they're completely independent of each other. And this independence also uh, exists mathematically so that you can actually do kinematics kinds of things. You can use the kinematic equations in the X dimension independently of using kinematic equations in the Y dimension, independently of using kinematics in the Z direction. So working in multiple dimensions just becomes a matter of splitting the problem into multiple dimensions doing the problem separately in multiple dimensions and then putting the answer together back into whatever form you want it to be in. And that's what we're going to be, we're, what we're going to be doing when we start off, excuse me, we start off in a very simple manner. Uh, before I go much further, Taylor and Matt, can you guys hear us out there? Yep. Do either of you have any questions concerning chapter three before we move on here? We're starting chapter four today. Any, I think I'm good. Any questions from the homework in chapter three? Lane, I see you're on now too with us. Any questions? No, no questions so far. All right. Vectors are probably the easiest thing we've done here so far. All right. Well, moving on then to chapter four, multiple dimensions. So we're gonna start off by doing some manipulations of vectors in multiple dimensions. Start off with a very simple, the very simplest vector, the position vector. Uh, when we were in one dimension, we had a position vector essentially just kind of told you where you were on a number line, right? You were either in the positive three or negative four or zero, or whatever, and that just told you where you were on the line somewhere. And of course, in multiple dimensions, you're gonna have more than one coordinate now, more than one number. And usually we, we denote them X, Y, and Z, not always, but usually. And your coordinates in X, Y, and Z will also tell you your position vector uh, in X, Y, and Z. And this can be time dependent. Uh, they sure they show them as time dependent functions. So if you have a time dependent position, 
uh, that means that your position changes over time, right? And uh, then it's essentially a function in time. You can also create the vector from the coordinates or from the position functions. And usually when we're in three dimensions, we call our position vector R. So your position vector R of T would be a composite of the X of T function, which tells you where, what the X coordinates doing in time times I hat plus the Y of T function times J hat plus the Z of T function times K hat. And that is your overall position vector in uh, multiple dimensions or three dimensions in this case. Of course, the position vector always starts from the origin and always points towards the points that are at the coordinates of your x, y, and t, sorry, x, y, and z uh, functions. So you can create a point using those three functions and then the vector, the position vector goes from the origin to that point. Um, then of course we go on to the next vector that is the, the next most simple vector, which is the displacement vector, which takes you from one point to another point. So you have two position vectors, uh, R1 and R2, and or it can be at R at T1 and R at T2, however you want to think about it. And the displacement vector will be the difference between those two. You take the R2 and subtract the R1 from it, and that gives you your displacement vector. And this is what this would look like out in three dimensions. You have your first position in your uh, P1, your second position at P2, and the delta R vector or the displacement vector goes from the first point to the second point. And that's what that difference does. The difference P2 minus P1 or, or R2 minus R1 creates this vector that goes from, R, goes from position one to position two as a displacement vector. Remember that position vectors always start at the origin and go out to a point, but all other vectors are just kind of out there somewhere. In this case, it's going between two points, but this vector can be represented anywhere really um, because displacement does not necessarily have to go from those two points. It can go from other two other points that are uh, equal distance part and in the same direction part, it would be the same displacement vector. So here we have a, a quick example. We have a satellite going in a circular polar orbit around Earth at an altitude of 400 kilometers. When it's in a polar orbit, it means that it is directly overhead at the north and south poles. So it's, um, it's in, that, in an orbit that always, uh, that no, it's, an or, it's in an orbit that um, ends up directly over the North Pole or directly over the South Pole at two different times. Um, the altitude is 400 kilometers. Uh, it's, they want to know what is the magnitude and direction of the displacement vector from when it is directly over the North Pole to when it is at negative 45 degrees latitude. So what would a, a picture of that look like? Here is the Earth. Here is when the satellite is directly over the North Pole, and here is when it is at negative 45 degrees latitude. Your latitudes are measured from the equator, up as positive, down as negative, right? So this orbit um, going from here to here has a displacement vector that goes from the beginning point, which is over the North Pole, to its ending point, which is at the negative 45 degree latitude. We're trying to figure out what that looks like. So we, we create the first vector for the first position. The first vector for the first position is going to be in the J hat direction because we've created our coordinate system so that X is pointing in the east direction, Y is pointing in the north direction. So when we're directly over the North Pole, we're only, we only have a northern vector that defines our position. Um, and remember, they said that it's 40 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, but we're measuring from the center of the Earth. So we have to add on the radius of the Earth to get the actual uh, position there, 637, 6,370 kilometers, add the 400 kilometers 
did they say 400 or yeah, 400 kilometers um, to get us into that orbit. So there is our beginning vector. Our second vector is going to be at the same altitude. So it's overall magnitude is the same, but the direction is quite different. So to do this, they actually use a very, um, this is a very common way of doing this, where they actually are going to build the vector by creating, by, by writing down the magnitude, 6,770 kilometers, just like the first vector. But then they create a unit vector in terms of I and J, that when you add these, when you add these two vectors together, you get a vector that is one unit long, but it's pointing in the direction that you want your vector to go in so that you can just have it in here. This one, ten, this one actually is quite easy to do because it's at 45 degrees. And so all you need to do is recognize that if you go out here, um, if, if, you're, if you're going from here to here and then here to here as your components for this vector, since they're both 45 degree angles, all you have to do is take the cosine of the negative 45 for the i hat term, because the i hat is going to be this vector here. That's this one here. So there's your i hat vector, and that has this 45 degree angle next to it. So that's going to be cosine. And they're going to use negative 45 to give it the correct sign, and that's fine. That gives us some negative. That gives us a positive for the cosine. And then the sign here is the opposite side from that angle here. So this this um, J hat component is also going to use the 45 degrees, the negative 45 degrees, but it's going to use the sine of negative 45 degrees. And when you use the cosine of negative 45 and the sine of negative 45, you will get the correct signs um, in your vector. So the cosine of negative 45 is actually just positive. So it, it leaves you with its positive square root over two over two. And that leaves you with uh, square root two over two times I hat and then the the sine of negative 45 is negative square root two over two, and you end up multiplying 6,770 6, times square root two over two to get 4787 times i hat. You do the same things, same thing times the negative square root two over two, and you get negative 4787, um, 4787 times j hat. And that becomes your ending position vector. So you get both of those terms. Now, to calculate the displacement, we need to take the difference, right? To take the difference between the two. The difference between these two vectors is the second one minus the first one. So you take the second one, for, which is uh, 4,787 i hat minus the i hat in the first one. Well, there is no i hat term in the first one. So it's this minus zero i hat. So you're just left with 4,787 i hat. But then you take the negative 4,787 and subtract 6,770 and you get negative 11,557 j hat. So that is the displacement vector in its, in its component form. To find the magnitude of that, you just use the Pythagorean theorem. There's the magnitude of the, of the displacement vector. And then the angle, you use the inverse tangent of the y component over the x component and you get an angle of negative 607, sorry, negative 67.5 degrees. And if you look at this picture, those things seem reasonable. The displacement is much longer than either of the original position vectors, which it definitely is in this picture. Um, it's about twice as long, so that's, that seems about right. Um, and then this angle, this negative 67 degrees that looks about that looks about negative 67 degrees so if you're measuring from here which we should be so that seems reasonable so position vectors in two dimensions uh, displacement vectors in two dimensions it's mostly the, the process is just as it's laid out here in this problem. You create your position vectors in two dimensions, and then you, you can add them, you can add them or subtract them. In this case, we're taking a difference to get 
get the displacement. And then you have your final displacement vector. And you can create, you can calculate the magnitude and angle if you want to. But we're really just doing these things separately. I mean, we, when you break your vectors into components, you're treating the x direction and the y direction separately. When you add them together in components, you're adding the i hat parts and the j hat parts separately. So you're doing the math separately because the x and y directions are independent, right? So that's what we do. We put put our vectors into component form, treat them, treat the different directions separately mathematically. Here's another problem where we have uh, Brownian motion. Brownian motion is the cha is chaotic motion that uh, that happens in nature quite often. And here they're doing it particles suspended in a fluid, which is where Brownian motion was first discovered, actually. Interesting enough, Brownian motion was named after a scientist, Brown, who uh, discovered this by observing pollen, uh, the movement of pollen in a, um, in a water suspension, so under a microscope in water. And he at first thought that these things, these pollen particles must be alive, like live animals, because they just moved around randomly. They, they were moving and he couldn't figure out if there was anything making them move. Um, and it wasn't until the 20th century, uh, Einstein came along and said, well, I think it was Einstein, was it Einstein or was it? Yeah, I think it was Einstein. But I think Einstein came along and said, actually, the reason that they're moving is that they're so small in mass that the movement of the water molecules is actually pushing around the pollen molecules. And that water molecules have this random motion that associ that's associated with them that is affecting these particles that are small enough to be affected by water molecules. Um, so something in, in Brownian motion was discovered probably 100 years or more before that. It was, it was quite an old idea thought, but they just didn't know what caused it. 20th century science was where we started to understand these things a little bit more. Anyway, so here they've got uh, displacements of a particular particle, four different displacements. So these are movements of a particle from, from one point to another, and they're represented as vectors in component form. And they want us to find the total displacement. Well, totals are always sums. So we just add these displacements together. And remember that when you're adding displacements, when you're adding vectors in any, in any, any kind of vector in component form, you add the i hat parts separately from the j hat parts, separately from the k hat parts. So that's what we're gonna do. Every one of these vectors has an i hat component. So we're adding two to negative one to four to negative three to get a total. And they do it here to, do, 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 of two in the i hat direction. Then they do the j hat direction, one plus zero plus negative two plus one again, and you get a zero overall in the j hat direction. So a zero displacement in the j hat direction. And then in the k hat direction, we have three plus three plus one plus two, which for a total of nine, positive nine in the k hat direction. And so our total displacement is two i hat plus zero j hat plus nine k hat microns of displacement. To find the magnitude of that, you just use the Pythagorean theorem. Doesn't matter if it's three dimensions, the Pythagorean theorem still works the same way. You take the square of each of the components, magnitudes, add them together, you take the square root, that's your magnitude. And then the angle, to calculate the angle is a little bit different in three dimensions than it is in two dimensions. Because you have, you might end up with three, well, you do always end up with three components to your vector. Which components to use to calculate the angle? Well, it depends on what angle you want because you have to measure an angle from an axis. So if you want to know what the angle is with respect to the Z axis, for example, measuring it from the Z axis, you use a different formula than if you want to know it from the Y axis or from the X axis and so on. So um, in this particular case, since we only have two non-zero components, uh, the X and the, the Z components, 
any, any, if we um, use these two numbers, if we use the Z component over the X component, then we will actually be measuring the angle with respect to the X axis in the X Z plane. So it's whatever, whatever number ends up on the bottom of this, in this case, it's the X component. That's the axis that you're measuring the angle with respect to. And then whatever one you have in the top tells you which plane you're in. So in this case, we have the X component on the bottom, the Z component on the top. That means we're measuring our angle in the X Z plane. And it also means that we're measuring from the X axis, measuring our angle from the X axis. Normally in two dimensions, for example, we'll, we'll use the inverse tangent of the Y component over this, the X component. And that means that we're measuring our angle from the, X, from the X axis in the X, Y plane. If you did this in, if you did this X over Z or, or Y over Z or something like this, then you would be measuring your angle from the Z axis in the Y, Z plane. And there are different planes you can measure your angles. Yes. Sir. So what if there it's not? What if the J panel is y zero? What if it's not zero? So then you would then you would want to probably measure angles from different from at least two different axes. So you'd calculate maybe two different angles. It doesn't really. Uh, I mean, you might even do three different ones if you wanted to be really thorough, I suppose. But I think that two would would do it. Um, if you have two angles one from one plane, one from the other plane, one in one plane, one in the other plane from two different axes. Uh, does that get you enough? I don't know. But anyway, uh, you, def you definitely need more than one angle to really kind of help people to visualize that for sure. You can also, um, yeah, two angles will do it for you. Two angles, you only, you only need two, you don't need two. But, um, as long as you know the magnitude of the vector. If you don't know the magnitude of the vector, you might need three angles. But um, the point is, uh, is that in three dimensions, figuring out where the vector is, is not nearly as simple as in two dimensions, or obviously in one dimension, it's really easy. But um, in two dimensions, you know, you need the length of the vector and an angle from an axis. In three dimensions, you're gonna need uh, the length of the vector and two angles from axes, or you're going to need all three components of the vector or whatever. So you need at least three things to figure out where, an, where a vector is in three dimensions, to figure out its magnitude and direction. You need at least two angles and a, and a, uh, and a length, or you need, you can do two lengths and an angle actually, or you can just use the component form, which is just three lengths, right? But you always need three things in three dimensions. So that's the displacement vector. Of course, the velocity vector now is um, related to the displacement vector. Is related. To, sorry, is is related to the displacement vector by taking the displacement vector and dividing by the time that that displacement takes. But the velocity vector is also related to the position vector if the position vector is a, is a uh, function of time. And in that case, it's the derivative, the time derivative of the, of the position vector, if it is a function of time, will give you the velocity vector as a function of time. And this is no different than one dimension. We just split it into three dimensions. In this case, you would look at the position vector in X and take its derivative in time. Look at the position vector, the part of it that's in the Y direction and, look, and you know, take its derivative in time. You can do all these derivatives separately because this, for the same reason that we could um, deal with them separately in adding and subtracting it's because they, when you have, um, when you have 90 degree coordinate systems or 90 degree coordinates, um, they are independent of each other. They're independent geographically or, or uh, geometrically, I guess, geometrically is the correct word. Um, but they're also completely independent mathematically. So uh, we, can, uh, we can deal with them thusly. And here they show that explicitly by actually splitting it into three different uh, 
time derivatives, totally legal. You're never going to have to um, worry that taking a time derivative here and this one is gonna affect one of these others, it won't. Of course, we also can calculate an average velocity. And in, in fact, um, unless you know, unless you have a functional form that describes your position perfectly in time, and you can take a derivative of that to calculate an instantaneous time, um, then you're always taking an average anyway. And that's where you take the displacement divided by the time. And that is still valid. So here we go ahead and we do these, we do this mathematical manipulation using a position vector that is a function of time. So here you can see that it's quadratic in time. Uh, in the x hat direction, it's linear in time. In the y direction, the j hat part is, only has t, it doesn't have a t squared. And in the k direction, it's also linear, it only has a t and nothing, no, no uh, bigger, uh, nothing more than that. Uh, they want us to find the instantaneous velocity and speed at t equals two seconds. And then they want us to find the average velocity between one and three seconds. Well, to find instantaneous velocity, we do need to find a function for the velocity. So we take the derivative of the position. To take the derivative of the position, remember that we're doing derivatives of polynomials. The derivative of a polynomial, you look at the exponent of any thing that has um, your independent variable in it, in this case, time. And our independent, our, uh, our exponent here has a, in the i hat, in the x part is t squared. We can go ahead and look at each one of them separately and do them separately and then just put them back together. So if we do this derivative just by itself, we take this, we take the exponent, we put it down in front and multiply by the exponent. So it becomes two times two times t. And then you subtract one from the exponent, two times two times t to the two minus one. That ends up being four times t, right? And then we can do this one is here, here as well. This 2.0 is 2.0 times t to the zero. So it's 2t to the zero. And when we bring the number and the exponent down in front, it multiplies by zero. So this first term goes to zero. Any constant term will become zero when you take a time derivative of it. So this is a constant of two, it just becomes zero. Then we have this three times t, this is three t to the one. So we multiply one times three the exponent times the number that's out in front times t to the one minus one. When one minus one is of course zero and t to the zero is one. So when we do the derivative of the second term, we just get three. So that's four t for the first term's coefficient, the second term's coefficient, we do the time derivative, we get three. The last one very similarly to this one becomes just five. And if we put it all back together, we put our i hat here, we put our j hat plus j hat here. There were no negative signs in here that we have to be careful of, so we're good. So this becomes our velocity as a function of time vector. And that's what they show down here. That's what this is right here. Four times t i hat plus three j hat plus five k hat and the units are kilometers per second. Then we want to know, they actually ask us for the instantaneous speed at two seconds. So we need to evaluate this new function when time is equal to two. We plug in two seconds, we get four times two, which is eight. The other two are constants, so they just stay as three and five. And this is our, this is our velocity, our, this is our instantaneous velocity at two seconds. Then they want to know what the speed is at two seconds. Well, the speed is just the magnitude of the velocity. So we take the magnitude by doing using the Pythagorean theorem, eight squared plus three squared plus five squared square root, ends up being 9.9 .9 meters per second. Then they want to know the average velocity between one second and three seconds. For that, we need to use the average velocity formula, which means we calculate the position at time one we calculate the position at time two, we take the position at two minus the position at one, and then we divide by the time difference. 
So we go ahead and do that. We calculate it in both places. We get these two velocity vectors at two different times. We divide by three minus one, which is two seconds. That means we divide each one of these terms by two up here. The 18 divided by two, 11 divided by two, 15 divided by two, the minus two divided by two, the minus five, uh, it's minus, every one of these is minus because there's a minus out in front. So each one of these divided by two, and then we, we go ahead and we combine the like terms. So we, get, we end up with eight, we get, end up with um, 18 divided by two minus two divided by two, and we end up with eight. Then we do the same with the 11 and the five divided by two, we end up with three. We do the same with 15 and the five divided by two, we end up with five, and there is our average velocity between seconds one and three. Here they give an example of the independence of motions. Um, and this is a great example. Did we talk about shooting a gun versus dropping a bullet? I don't think so in this class. But that's what this is. This example is um, the independence of motion between uh, one dimensional motion, just like dropping something in gravity. So let's say that we have a, we have a bullet from a gun that we're just gonna drop from you know, like head height or something. And what happens to that bullet is it, um, it starts off with no velocity right as you release it, but immediately begins to accelerate downward. After one second, because it's accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared, after one second, that bullet will be moving downward at 9.8 meters per second. And then after two seconds, it'll be moving downward at 18, 19 rather, 0.6 uh, meters per second. And it adds 9.8 meters per second of speed every second that it's accelerated at 9.8 meters per second, per second, right? Um, it won't be in the air very long if you drop it from head height and the ground is at your feet, but it'll, it'll only be in the air for a fraction of a second before it hits the ground. Now, if you take that same bullet and you throw it forward, perfectly horizontally forward, its downward motion will remain the same as it was if you, as if you just dropped it. And why is that? Well, because downward motion is at 90 degree angle to forward motion. In this case, we're considering forward motion to be parallel to the ground, downward motion to be perpendicular to the ground, so they're 90 degrees to each other. That means moving forward has nothing to do with going downward. Gravity will still pull that bullet downward and it will still, after one second, be going 9.8 meters per second downward. And after two seconds, be going twice that fast. And after three seconds, be going three times that fast. And it will still reach the ground in the same amount of time as if you just dropped it, even though you threw it forward. And there's often the, the case where people say, but when bullets come out of, a, out of a gun, they're spinning and that makes them go forward more. It does not. It does not change the motion of the bullet at all to spin it, unless you consider air currents Air currents can cause air, well, air causes friction with the bullet, and air currents with the bullet cause the bullet to fall an erratic pattern as it goes forward. But it still doesn't really affect how the ball, how the bullet falls. Right? So if you do this without any air friction at all, it doesn't affect it at all. And if you do it with air friction, it only depend, it only affects kind of the path of the bullet forward. It doesn't affect it really going downward. It certainly doesn't make it stay in the air longer. Um, so, and this is, this is illustrated very poorly in movies, for example. Hollywood is infamous for, for making these, these bullet things happen when people are shooting guns that are just ridiculous, quite, quite, honest, quite honestly. Uh, for example, if you drop a bullet from head height, how long does it take to hit the ground? You can do the calculation or you can just think about it, just drop something from head height. And it takes a little less than a second, about a half a second for you to drop something from head height and it hits the ground after about a half second. That means that when you shoot a bullet from a gun, the bullet has hit the ground after about a half a second. And yet in movies, they shoot bullets and then like a second or two later, it hits something or someone. 
which is just ridiculous. By then it would already hit the ground, especially if you're shooting parallel to the ground in the movies, they're almost always shooting parallel to the ground or very close to parallel to the ground. Right? The other thing that's ridiculous about having a bullet strike something seconds later after it's been, after it's been fired or even one second later is kind of ridiculous. Um, is that the bullets are moving at approximately 500 meters per second coming out of a gun, which is faster than the sound coming out of the gun, much faster. Sound coming from anything moves through air at about 330 meters per second. And the bullet's going 500 meters per second, which means by the time you hear the gun, by the time the sound reaches you from a gun, the bullet has already reached you or passed you it's already passed you, or if it hit you, it went through you already, or it's already hit you. And so this idea of you hearing a gun and then moving out of the way to avoid being shot, which happens all the time in movies, is ridiculous because it's already hit you if you've heard it, or it's already passed you if you've heard it. So the most likely thing that has only happened in one movie that I've ever seen, the movie was called The Island, um, but in that one movie, somebody gets shot, but they get shot before they hear it. So they do the, they actually do the gunshot in slow motion and he feels the impact of the bullet and then he hears it. And then he looks down, which is the way it happens in real life. <clears throat> so the physics of movies is almost always completely wrong. There's almost never a movie that portrays the physics of things correctly. And if you, think, if you think there are people out there that go to movies and pay attention, if you, if you think there aren't people that go to movies and pay attention to physics, think again, because I'm one of those people. <laughs> I actually get really kind of angry with movies that portray the physics wrong. So I'm often angry when I watch movies, <laughs> but that's okay. Anger is good sometimes, helps you to purge emotion. Anyway, uh, so this, I, I believe I, I may have asked, I may have put this question in the homework at some point where, uh, where, you're, where you're asked to estimate how, how long a bullet is in the air if you fire it perfectly horizontally to the ground from about head height, from about two meters. And I often give the, I give the, the people answering the question three options, one second, five seconds, or 10 seconds, you know, about how long is the bullet in the air? Give the best answer. And the most common answer is five seconds, usually, which is way, way too long. The next most common answer is 10 seconds, which is even way too longer. The answer will be if you fire a bullet from average kind of human height, parallel to the ground, it will reach the ground in, in about one second or less. Uh, this is true in, in everything like sports as well. Uh, the, for example, if you ask somebody who's a sports fan of basketball, somebody who watches basketball all the time, and you say, what is the average hang time of a basketball player in the NBA? Well, it's kind of like twice the length of a bullet being in the air at best. Because if you throw a bullet upward and then it falls downward to the ground again, that's about the hang time of anything that jumps high. And basketball players do not jump as high as head height at all. They don't even come close. Most basketball players have a vertical of less than a meter. And that's, that's average. average. The average basketball jump in the, in the NBA is, is much less than a meter. It's, around, it's just a little 30 inches probably. Um, and the really good jumpers are less than a meter and a half. So um, the best jumper ever in the NBA had a 52 inch vertical, I think. He could, jump, he could actually jump and touch 52 inches higher than he could reach by just standing on the ground. And he was a rather short player. Taller players tend to jump lower, tend to jump much, have much lower verticals. So for example, um, I would be surprised if LeBron James jumps over 35 inches. He doesn't have to, he's tall. So it doesn't matter if he can jump that high, he can still reach really high. Um, but uh, but other, other players that are much shorter 
tend to jump much higher. The highest jumpers in the world are undoubtedly high jumpers in, in track and field. And they look nothing like basketball players. They're not tall, they're, um, they're not muscular. They're usually skinny and kind of medium height. <laughs> and they much, have much higher jumps. And they can stay in the air for almost two seconds as a high jump, almost, not quite. Most NBA players, less than a second and a half, less than a second, actually, most NBA players, uh, less than a second and a half for the best jumpers ever in the NBA. <clears throat> My particular sport is men's volleyball. Most men's volleyball players are jumping about a second and a quarter, or second and a half. They jump much higher than most basketball players, but they're also much skinnier. So, and that makes a difference with jumping. Anyway, so that gives you an idea of how to deal with vectors in multiple dimensions here. We'll move on to the talk about the acceleration vector, which of course is gonna be treated just like it was in one dimension, but we're just gonna treat it separately in three different dimensions. It has the same exact definitions mathematically, except in this case, we're now going to take a derivative of three-dimensional vector, which means we'll take a derivative of uh, the x component, a derivative of the y component, a derivative of the z component all separately and put them back together, just like we did with the velocity vector. We also, just like with the velocity vector, if you, if you consider velocity to be a time derivative of position and acceleration to be a time derivative of velocity, then acceleration is the second time derivative of position. So you can also use that to your advantage. In this problem here, in this example, they give us a velocity vector that is time dependent, and we calculate the acceleration vector by taking the first time derivative of this velocity vector. Really quite simple. We go ahead and do this. The first time derivative of the five times t is five. The first time derivative of two times, or sorry, the first time derivative of t squared ends up being two times t. And the first time, uh, first time derivative of negative two t cubed is negative six t squared. And so there is our acceleration vector in component form. If we want to know what the acceleration is at two seconds, we plug in two for the time here and we get the acceleration vector at two seconds. Happens to be five i hat plus four j hat minus 24 k hat meters per second squared. We can calculate the magnitude of the acceleration using the Pythagorean theorem. And uh, we are good. We could also calculate the angle with respect to different axes if we wanted to know kind of the direction with respect to different, uh, with respect to the different coordinates. If we wanted to do that, we could. They don't do it, but we can do it. Uh, here they do it again, but this time they've been, they've told us the function of position here. So this is the time dependent function of position. If we want to find out the acceleration, we need to take two time derivatives. So we do the first time derivative in each x, each coordinate or each component, x component, y component, z component. And that gives us the v, the velocity vector. And then we take the second time derivative to get the acceleration vector. It turns out the acceleration vector is no longer time dependent because we've taken two time derivatives and the original function was only quadratic in time. So the first time derivative brought it down to linear, a linear function for the velocity. And the second time derivative brought it down to a constant acceleration vector. So this acceleration, the acceleration of this particular particle is constant at negative two meters per second squared in the x direction, i hat direction. So, if we want to calculate what the acceleration is at any particular point in time, we can plug in uh, t into that function, but it won't change it. It'll just always be negative two in the i hat direction. Here they go ahead and plot these things. They plot the position, that's what the stars are. These are the positions of the particle. And then they plot the velocity of the particle, which is uh, let's see. Is that right? 
yeah, so the position is actually the blue. No, which one is which? I can't. Does it have a thing here that tells us? Starts at zero, zero, zero. Yeah, so I, this three dimensional, so it's hard to see, it's hard to see what is what here. Uh, okay, so the projection of the trajectory. So that, so yeah, the position is the, um, the position is the blue dots apparently. Let's see what does it say? The particle starts with position vector R0 as shown with blue dots, okay. Yeah, so the position is the blue dots, the red stars. This is like a breakfast cereal or something. I think it starts, it starts with the bottom of the velocity, right? Yeah. Yep. So it's got, um, so this, this one here, this blue dot thing is showing us the parabolic path, essentially, you could think of it as. Um, the, the parabolic path is due to the, the time dependence being um, quadratic here in the R vector. So that's going to definitely have a parabolic shape to it. So that's what this curve is. I don't think that it shows that extremely well, but it kind of does. Um, I suppose. And then the, um, they're saying the projection of the trajectory onto the XY plane is shown with red stars. So what they've done here is they're showing you the shadow of the X in the XY plane, the X is, um, X is coming out of the page and Y is kind of to the right-ish, right? So that's kind of like the tabletop if this was a tabletop. What they're showing us here with the, with the stars is they're showing the shadow of our particle on the, on the table below. Now that is not immediately apparent, but that's what they're trying to show. This parabola is actually coming, is actually going upward and coming out of the page. And that's kind of difficult to see, but that's what it's doing. These just show you what the shadow looks like on the table. So, it, so on the table, it's like it's going into the page um, and to the right. That's what, it's, that's what it looks like on the shadow of, of, of this table that we've created with the XY plane. But the, what it's actually doing is it's actually going, um, it's actually going into the page to the right and up, up the page. So those three things combined lead us to this blue and they, they should have chosen a better position in the, in, the, um, in the coordinate system to make this a little easier to, to really see, but that's what it is. That's what they're doing. And then if they, then if you uh, plotted the change, in, if you plotted the velocity, you would, you would find out that the velocity is increasing. So the velocity is increasing over time. It's getting faster and faster and faster over time. And that we learn from the velocity, the velocity equation, which we had back here in that photo. And then, so the velocity has this, it's, it's um, well, it actually is, uh, it's constant in the, uh, it's constant in the, the X, uh, the Y and Z direction, but it has this acceleration in, it has a change in time in the, in the X direction. And I say increasing, but it actually will, the, the velocity starts off, um, it starts off in one direction and ends up going another direction. So it has a turnaround point. And that's because uh, this, this complex behavior over here in the, in the velocity. And then the acceleration is constant. Yeah. We're creating a movement function like that one that we started with when we're breaking down. Creating one of those from the velocity function that we just created and then just plotting it across. So creating a position function is not something that you do using mathematics. It's something that you do by observing what's happening. So what they do is they, 
map out you know all the different points of position of a particle and you can do that doing different using different things you can use a computer to do it and you could just mark it on a map or whatever and then what well, you're going to use some kind of fitting routine to fit a polynomial function to that curve right and the fitting routine is really the only math that you will do and it's an it's a way of approximating a curve using some given points right something that you may have done in a calculus class if you've taken Calc two, you might have done that uh, a fitting routine. Mm -hmm. So that's something that is observed and then modeled to a polynomial. You can do it theoretically as well, but that's it's kind of like a chicken or the egg situation, right? You can use the theory of of you know, gravitational acceleration, you know, you can use Newton's law of gravitation, general gravitation, to say this is theoretically how this particle should move and then go on from there. But that's immediately assuming that everything out in the universe is ideal and follows perfectly the laws of physics, which it does not. So, did you have any other questions about that? No, you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the whole point of taking calculus courses is to make the connection between the make they make the connection between all those weird things that they had you doing, limits and other things where they were having you to, you know, you're doing these limits where you're essentially zeroing in on a point, uh, you're zeroing in on the average between two points or whatever. That's what all those limits did. And the, the end result of that is what we're trying to accomplish here. That's why Newton invented calculus was to do these kinds of problems. So, all right. So anyway, in the end, we find that there are kinematic equations for all of these dimensions as well. You can have kinematic equations in the X and Y and Z, and they all look the same, except you just replace X with Y or Z. And your velocity is now a velocity in the X direction or a velocity in the Y direction or a velocity in the Z direction depending on which set of kinematic equations you're using. Um, but you always end up with essentially the same math in all dimensions. You just need to treat them all separately. And here they do an example of solving a problem with kinematics in multiple dimensions. You, you split it up. This is now your position in X. This is your velocity in X. This here is your position in Y. This is your velocity in Y. And the velocity in y affects the position in y, not in x. And you use it in the kinematic equations with the y stuff. You use them all separately, right? So this number would, this velocity would be used with this position in the x kinematic equations to solve for what happens in x. This velocity along with the negative sign and this position with the negative sign would be used in kinematic equations for y to solve for what happens in Y. And if you had Z components, the same thing would happen to Z. And you do all of your solving using the kinematic equations in separate, in separate um, coordinates, do it all separately, and then you put it all together at the end to get an answer in the coordinates. So here's your A sub X, here's your A sub Y, different accelerations in X and Y, um, different positions and velocities. You use the same equations, but you use them for all the X and Y and Z stuff separately. And in the end, you end up with an answer for your final velocity that has an X component from the stuff you did in the X and a Y component from the stuff you did in Y. And you combine it to get the total velocity vector. And that's how we deal with things in two dimensions. We will come back to this on. Friday to do to do these examples in more detail and to help you with any questions from the homework, but that pretty much um, teaches us everything we need to know about two dimensional motion. We will do more examples with projectile motion, circular motion, relative motion, but these are all just applications of this stuff. So we will see you on Friday to do more of those applications. Have a good day.
You too, thank you.